Darnell L. Moore is a uh, media maker, an educator, writer, and thought leader, and the author of the 2019 Lambda Literary Award winning memoir, No Ashes in the Fire, Coming of Age, Black and Free in America. And I got my copy. I'm proud to, to say I got to get the hard copy. Uh, see, the fact that I have the paperback is, I told on myself, but I, I, I read it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> uh, but going back, man, Darnell, um, uh, this book was listed among the New York Times 100 notable books and was a Barnes and Noble Discover Great Writers pick. His writings have also appeared in the New York Times, Playboy magazine, Vanity Fair, Vice, The Guardian, The Nation, Ebony magazine, uh, among other publications. He is currently a vice president of inclusion strategy for content and marketing at Netflix and was the former head of strategy and programs at Breakthrough. U.S. Darnell has also, of course, been an advocate for gender equality, uh, equity, and sexual diversity. He has served as a co-managing editor at the Feminist Wire since 2010, and he was also a wide writer in residence at the Center on African American Religion, Sexual Politics, and Social Justice at Columbia University. And in 2019, he was a founding fellow at the Annenberg Innovation Lab at UCLA. That is just the tip of the iceberg on his uh, his uh, long, extensive, and impressive resume. But most of all, y'all, he is a human being, a human uh, who's invested in moving our society forward. And I just, I'm grateful for you to be here. My brother, my friend, Darnell Mo, how are you, man? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Oh my gosh. Um, bios always make me sweat. And I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here like sweating under this shirt. Um, Why are you so sweating? You're sweating from the memories? You're embarrassed about the achievements? I do It's just something about it. Just, but I'm just so grateful to be here with you. So grateful mm-hmm. to be here with you. Grateful to have you. I really am. And I mean that. I always do mean that with every guest, but uh, I know your life. I know you. I know how busy you are. I know what you've achieved. I know what you continue to work on. And taking this time is a big deal. And I appreciate it, man. So thank you so much. Um, I also want to say, uh, full disclosure to the audience, I know Darnell well. Um, <laughs> we're not every day talking on the phone, friends like that, but we are definitely friends with history and have been around each other for quite some time, well over 10 years at this point. And man, I was just in LA, home in LA, visiting family, doing the thing, family reunion, dad's 80th birthday, all the things. But before I went, I decided, I don't know why, God put it in my spirit. I called Darnell. I called Darnell and said, I'm coming to town. He's like, all right, let me know when you get here. Uh, and I did, and it was the first stop I made, and I had a wonderful Friday yeah, afternoon. We were just chilling, uh, yeah, Friday. Chilling, maxing and relaxing, man. And I <laughs> ate it and appreciate you. And he uh, he led to me considering a move to be back home at least part time. Listen, y'all heard it. Y'all heard it. Y'all heard <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> it's real, man. It re- it resonates. I came back here and I was like, "Listen, babe, we got to talk about some things, cause." Yes. Yeah, I might need some time on the West Coast. Maybe not full time, but half the time at, at the very least. But I just want to thank you, man. But, you know, you and another group of our, our friends have all made this transition from the East Coast to the West Coast. Not always an easy transition, particularly mm-hmm. for people from the Northeast, from New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of people have difficulty transitioning. But you seem to have found, found your way. And I'm sure the job doesn't hurt. But what's the transition been like for you? And how's it affected, um, you know, how you move in the world and, and the things you're doing? And I've shared this with you, but part of the way that my life was oriented in New York and just the East Coast in general, like I'm a, you know, I describe myself as a Timberland wearing in the summertime East Coaster, you know what I mean? Um, And in so many ways, I was like, uh, you know, like a hamster on a wheel, just running, Mm -hmm. um, busy, doing good things, doing things that I love, but very, very busy. And I was... I needed and wanted a different pace for myself. You know, I'm 47 mm-hmm. and doing that type of running for two decades, you know, I was working since I was a teen. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I wanted something that demanded of me a bit more. I wanted to live a bit more. I wanted to breathe a bit more. I wanted to slow down. I want to, I want people ask like, what are you working on right now? And I'm like living. <laughs> I'm finally learning what it means to like sit my ass down and to breathe, yeah. to be in touch with my body, um, to to be available so that I can be talk to my sisters and my mom and my nieces and nephews, to be available to my partner, to build community, mm-hmm. which are to me 
just as important manifestations of a politic, a political way of life than all the other things I was doing, you know, like yeah. being a mouthpiece, always got something to say, um, you know, causing ruckus when things are going on and the communities in which I'm a part, which are all great. They were all great too. But at this point in my life, I feel called to just be and to, to, to sort of live out my politics, my demand for love in a different way. Mm -hmm. That's good stuff, man. So West Coast affords that for me. Like I still wake up like, Oh shit, there's owls. (laughs) (laughs) Like there's a mountain over there. There's like a beach too. And it's slow in a very beautiful way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the quote Trisha Hersey, the nap industry rest is resistance. And sometimes, you know, you got to take care of yourself. You got to rest. You got to, you got to recharge those batteries in, in order to continue to do the work. And sometimes the work is uh, resting. Um, you're vice president inclusion strategy for content and marketing at Netflix. That sounds like a big mouthful. Um, and it's a, it's a corporate gig for sure. Uh, but it hasn't stopped you from doing the work you're doing. What's it been like being in a, in a bigger company uh, in this point in your life? And as you continue to do your other work? In so many ways, like I, I tell people this all the time, I'm I'm quite surprised that I, I landed in a position that both feeds my stomach, of course, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, but it also feeds my spirit. Uh, to to do work within a space where I'm allowed to be myself, you know, black, queer, mm-hmm. with all of the sensibilities, all of the worlds that I bring with me, honest, yeah. you know. Um, is a I welcome I just appreciate that um, for me I I have always understood culture and or entertainment or what we see on TV or the screen as viable tools to help people think differently about themselves and if I can have any small part to play in just helping to broaden to add more right, um, narratives to that conversation by the virtue of the work that my team does, I, I can't, I can only be proud of that, you know? So mm-hmm. um, it's a, the, the scale of, the, of, the, of a place that I've, I've not worked in a company as large, but I worked in corporate spaces before um, in doing digital media f- uh, as an editor, you know, but I've also worked in spaces that were not corporate like I worked in nonprofit <laughs> organizations that I would never run back. I would not run back to because the culture of the place did not allow for me to do work in such a way that I felt like I can either do the best work of my life or be my truest self. Mm. Um, and that's not true. All of us, all, all of us, there's been churches like that, right? Ministries. I can go on. Yeah. So for me, I tried to think less about um, the container and more about the energy that's within the container, the energy that might allow me to do work that I think can have a ripple effect on the lives of, 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 of others. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful work. I've been here for four years, it's kind of going quick. Um, and I am an Aquarius who knows when it's my time to go. And mm-hmm. when I know it's my time to go, I leave. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hence why I've been able to do a lot of different things over the course of the, the two decades I've been and plus working, but I've, I've been, I've been good. Like I've, I've, I, um, I find it challenge the challenges of learning a new landscape, a new environment, Hollywood, the entertainment landscape, the production landscape has been welcoming to me. I welcome it. It's been cool. Very, really very cool. good. And we'll revisit that a little bit later in the conversation though. But you know, the podcast is uh, really about the importance and the power of uh, understanding and then embracing and loving your authentic self. And the theme for the season uh, is love for love and blackness. And yeah. I literally can't think of too many people who fully embody uh, the theme and the ethos of the podcast as much as you do, man. You walk this walk and you live your life authentically. I, I want to unpack with you a little bit of the meaning of the resonance uh, behind both blackness and what blackness is and the concept of love. But before we even get there, let's just talk about this notion of an authentic self and, and how we kind of arrive there. We've talked about what your current job is and some sure. of the jobs you've done, but who is Darnell Moore at his core? Who are you? Oh my gosh. You know, it's interesting. We talked about my bio before here and typically I have come to a point where I've, le- I've less relied on the need to tell people what it is that I do, i.e. the 
the gigs that I might commit to in order to make money, in order to live, you know, mm-hmm. like I am a writer. Sometimes that's announcement to say that this is as an artist, this is how I make my money or I am an activist in the, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or I am a vice president of Netflix. I typically am more inclined to talk about the things that I love and um, the things that inspire me at, so at core, like, I am a I am a child of Camden, New Jersey. A child of a mother who, before I even a, a mother for whom taught me enough about the valuing of the love of family, mm-hmm. and a love of self and the care of your people before I had an understanding of what a sort of black liberationist politic was, or what a black feminist politic was. I, I say this everywhere, but I come from a family, and this is for good for better and worse, wherein anytime somebody knocked on the door, we were packed in our home. And this mm-hmm. will give you a sense of who I am. Yeah, Packed. I mean, I'm on the floor, mom's on the couch of grandma and grandpa's house, three bedroom house, aunties and uncles in, in some rooms, some people living in the basement. But the house was packed because whenever people were in need, they welcomed us in. Mm-hmm. Could have just came from jail, you ain't pay child support, strung out. Your boyfriend ran amok, put his hands on you. You you ran away with the kids to come have a place to stay. And we were all there in that space. And we all had something to eat. And we all had, took, had a type of collective care that meant, auntie, when Dar- when your mommy don't have money, Darnell, you got to go to this private school. I'm going to make sure that you get on the bus. I'm going to give you my last dime. So at core, I learned something about love as a, not a poetic, Hallmarkish way of living out my life, but a way of, doing a thing yeah an action um and so that's who i am like i regardless of where i exist in the world by virtual geography a job whatever um who i am at my core somebody that is has been taught to um to give to make sure that my folk are okay whoever my folk are my communities are okay um yeah, that's why I am basic, basic, cool though, cool, cool. But basic, I, can, I can vouch you know for that. I can vouch for that. <laughs> cool, you cool. Uh, now that that's that's poetic, <laughs> but it's also true, and I, I recognize that in and seeing you, talking to you, being around you, uh, that's very much true. But it's good to hear those words come from your mouth, uh, my dear friend and brother and pastor Mike Walman always speaks about um, how our gifts make uh, room for us and, and give some inclination to the things that we are called to to do and how we're called to serve here, because our gifts come through us, right? Our gifts come through us, but they're meant to be used in service of other people. What do you feel? We know who you are now, but who? Do, what do you feel you're called to do in this life? What's your calling in this this life as you exist, Arna? Um, I've always been uncomfortable with. Um, I, I I could never sit be comfortable when others around me were under duress, were. Um, in some form of injustice, harm. Um, Very early on, very, very early on, um, I give an example, like at at 13 or 14 years old in Camden, New Jersey, um, in response to some racist shit that I think, that I assume, perceive was going on with the way that the media was talking about the school that I went to. Like, I wrote this really probably... I'm going to say radical because at a 14, 13 year old, I'm like, I don't know how the hell I wrote this black, <laughs> black. I mean, it just, it was fist bump in the air personified. Right. Yeah. And, but that came, it was, it was written out of a type of righteous and like a righteous rage, a righteous rage, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I ended up winning the citywide poetry contest on the backs of that poem. But that gives you a sense that I, I've always been, and I'm very aware of this. I've, I've always been very aware of the lightning, the electricity that goes off in myself when I am made aware of um, others around me, whoever they might be in my orbit, who have been somehow, um, whose lives and hope and joy and peace 
and livability and like has been disrupted by the state by 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 pundits by um by re by researchers whoever it might be like i have an instantaneous response and when i think about the trajectory of my life it's really clear to me that um while i get you know i people get excited about like titles and thing and positions that I have, like the work that I'm mo- most proud of is a shit. They don't really show up on the bylines. You know, mm-hmm. it's the organizing work that I've been able to do in front behind, like without anybody around. Yeah. It's me, you know, young brother in Newark when I'm living in Newark, black, gay, perceived to be gay, walking down the street, gets shot because somebody's calling him names. And, you know, I don't like people being hurt. I don't like folk for whom, have already had to sort of live their lives with feet on their damn necks, having to lift, to having to lift those feet up every day. So I organize a pizza party for him and get him get. I mean, just bait like yeah. it's that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. So I guess I would say I'm a person that has been um, inspired, called, motivated to use my voice, to use whatever, to use whatever facilities I have, resources I have, access points for the betterment and uplift of those with whom I'm coming up with in in my community. And there you are being love, which you said you are and putting that into action because love is indeed an action word, putting that love into action by how you show up in other people's lives. When, whether they call or not, you're showing up for people who need the support, need the help and need the voice. Now that's, that's a wonderful way to be. And the thing with that is, and or with anybody who's being who they're, you know, made to be, you're going to find joy in it regardless of the circumstances because you're doing the thing and being the person that you were created to be. This is the reason in many ways not to spiritualize everything, but it's the reason that you exist. Yeah. Uh, and, and to be that and to do that is going to, it's going to bring you joy. And I bring that up because I think it's just so important as people listen, you know, I don't, I don't do this show for likes and follows. <laughs> if I did, I'd probably be spending more money marketing it and such. I really do this so that we're connecting with other people and people can understand and see the value in going inside, right? And understanding and embodying who they are and loving that and then being that and sharing those gifts because I believe that's where everybody's joy ultimately comes from. You can be happy when you have things. Happiness comes from things outside of you. A new car, a new house, new man, new girl, you're happy. But when it's gone, you're sad. But when you're being who you were created to be when you know who you are and whose you are uh that that's that pile of light of joy that kind of burns infinitely in, inside you and i just think it's important Did everybody just catch the serving that real quick did y'all catch that was, <laughs> that was good i got I, my offering let me go get my offering you too funny from one seminary graduate to another although i didn't of go to like you uh but that that's you know as always a thorough and, and an honest answer man i want to pivot though now to to the blackness right sure. you know we talk about being black we talk about blackness and we're all familiar with the heinous uh, anti-blackness that's so prevalent in our in our world and our society but i don't think people really think about it for you know very long what blackness really is or what it means to you i know you grew up in camden new jersey uh mm-hmm. share a little bit about your early days in camden man and how it shaped your understanding of blackness mm-hmm. as a concept and how you embody your blackness um you know camden is a is a small city um that is in many ways, for those of us that live there, felt very densely populated, packed with people. It is, you know, you know people by virtue of their family, its last names, the Lewises, mm-hmm. the Jenkins, you know, the Millers. Don't say nothing um, about Miss Jenkins. Listen, and these and these families tend to have um, stories connected to them. Neighbors on, uh, you know, Camden is replete with like row homes, so houses are very close together. So. Mm-hmm. The built environment necessitates connection. Sometimes you don't want that damn connection. Right. Sometimes you like get me disconnected from them, uh, but you connected nonetheless, and everybody's and everybody's stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so in so many ways, like what you what I learn are the sort of variances of blackness, the variances like blacknesses. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, you come, you know, like you discover that some of the black people in your block they come from Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic and they, they speak in Spanish and they darker, they, you know, I'm like, Mm -hmm. and they, they call themselves black. And then you got the folk down the street that are, um, you know, who are, who are from Trinidad and, 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 and all of So 
it's I learned very quickly without even having this as a sort of full awareness, but I was certainly attuned to the fact that, you know, in what we might understand to be sort of a conceptual frame that we call blackness exists mm-hmm. multitudes. Yeah. Is this multitudes and that certainly like influence. So, you know, when I'm talking about, you know, I've, all, I've often said, I've repeated this in places too, that black was queer before queer was cool. And mm-hmm. by queer, I don't mean sexually. I mean, queer as it was intended to be understood as a, um, think about queerness as a raising or a smudging of the lines that are drawn for us. Mm-hmm you know, like a removal of the lines that have been set up around traditional understanding of things, a smudging of the line between gay and straight, a smudging of the line between the masculine, these binaries. It's it's a way to say, like, if these have been given to us as ideas, sometimes a lot of the ideas that we've been given haven't necessarily been helpful. So let me just erase the lines around some of this shit and reimagine what this could be anyway i say that to say blackness was queer before queer was cool blackness has always acted out in that way right Mm -hmm. like as black folk um family structures as an example you want to talk about camden look didn't have to look like the traditional quote unquote family structure in order in order for it to be understood as normal normativized and good you know, I come from a family mostly of women, matriarchal lines for the most part, yeah. very constant, you know, so I can go on and on, but that's the shit I learned from the streets. When you learn that, you know, that second person that is really a neighbor that you call a cousin, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, blackness allows for, um, for that type of agility, for that type of, and this is why I get so upset then when we, when we do things like, you know, we say Black Lives Matter, but when you start talking about that trans shit, it don't really fit within this conversation. Or, right. you know, we say Black Lives Matter, but why? Why we? What that got to do with with pride? Or what, what that got to do with me too? Blackness, if we really talking about the type of blackness I understand to be uh, what it is, it's not like an identity category that's necessarily based on my blood, but a political category that is about liberation and freedom, and one that imagines a type of bigness. Mm-hmm in our cultural milieu that allows all of us how we show up to be. That's what blackness means to me. And that's what I've seen lived out on the streets that I grew up on. Yeah. It's, I asked the question because getting that insight from you and understanding how you've experienced it, how you come to know is really important in understanding why you do the work that you, you know, that you're called to do. Um, so many of us come from similar environments. I grew up in South Central LA, same kind of thing. Lots of diversity in the blackness, lots of diversity in the expression of the types of family units that people existed mm-hmm. in. And even the queer thing wasn't a thing. I mean, I have my mom's best friend who I call aunt and her mm-hmm. kids who I call cousins cousins we were close closer than any blood family could possibly be they even had her mom had a friend who miss mabel or something or other i look back now and i realize like oh my gosh she was trans and i had no idea what trans even was at the time but we just kind of knew that as a group as a mass as people with brown hued skin we kind of sit outside of the quote unquote alleged mainstream Mm -hmm. and that there's going to be joy, there's going to be life, there's going to be Mm -hmm. richness of life in the diversity, in the embrace of those who are adjacent to your family Mm -hmm. or in your family and to to embody that. And something's just been happening over the last uh, couple of decades where that's kind of broken down and that that Mm -hmm. sense of of love is kind of wafted away on some level. And it's tragic to see, but it's important to to think Mm -hmm. about because those kinds of things are things that ultimately we've got to, um, you know, embrace as we move forward and we and we try to heal from the wounds and and the trauma that have been and continue to be. Well, I was going to say, I mean, we have the uh, it's it's two of us. It's the two of us that's having this conversation. I imagine if this platform was open up to maybe another some others, you know, who still, who still believe or put their faith in an idea of blackness and a black liberation that centers, say, black cis hetero men, as mm-hmm. an example. Mm-hmm. Is that, and I don't want to talk shit like, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to whip like wax poetic and act like we still don't exist in a space where there are still people who are living in a very myopic, small, unliberatory, 
um, framework of like black freedom, black liberation, a blackness that don't help us. It's a, it's, you know, I often say like, I want to believe that when Martin Luther King was up there talking about, I have this, I have a dream speech that on that, on, on the mountaintops and in the valleys that he also saw Rustin and Diane Nash as just as free in that imagination as everybody else. I want to believe that, but I also know that some of the very people we have lifted up who have helped us come to even, um, you know, understand like notions of black freedom had a very, very limited, uh, <laughs> their imaginaries. The, 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 yeah. I, I, I'll always say, who was present in your freedom dream? Yeah. Robin D.G. Kelly's, right? Like who is present and alive in your freedom dream? And I, I do, so many of our folks still, um, we still have work to do. I don't want to even pathologize it. We have work to do to enhance yeah. our freedom dreams and our imaginations, Black, uh, to include all Black, all the Black folk. And ultimately, all the human folk. I mean, exactly right. This 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 sense of difference based on skin color is, of course, a Western thing, and it's new. And it's, I mean, I didn't. People in Africa don't know what blackness is until they come to America or somewhere in the West. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand. And I'm, you know, it's embarrassing to have to say this out loud, but I didn't really understand uh, how the blackness I was living in was affecting me until I took my first trip to a completely black country and realized how profoundly different uh, just navigating the airport was in a country where, wait, there is no black because everybody's black. This is just what everybody is. Um, it, it's fascinating. And it also became irrelevant like overnight. And so you realize that this construct we're living in doesn't have to be. It only exists because it's benefiting a certain group of people for certain reasons. And even that group of people are at the end of the day, uh, not beneficiaries because the separation, the division that it causes harms us all. We as humanity are better together without a doubt, because none of us exist in a vacuum and none of us can do it all alone. Unless you're going to grow the cotton, make your clothes, grow your food. Eat, you, we rely on each other uh, to, to exist, man. And, I hate to see these constructs divide us, um, which brings me to love, man. I just, you have a very interesting uh, definition of love that I want to unpack a little bit. And I want to share a definition that I've come to embrace. Uh, the definition that I've come to embrace uh, was developed by M. Scott Peck. And I got it from reading Bell Hooks. And that is that love is the will to extend oneself for the purpose mm -hmm. of nurturing one's own or another spiritual growth. That love is as love does. Love is an act of will. Namely, it's an intention and an action. Will implies choice too. So we do not have to love. We choose to love. And you have defined love as removing the distance between you and, and, and another person. And that, that hit me in a very profound way. Say more about your definition of love and how you've come to understand that and then compare that and contrast that to the, the one I just shared. And, and uh, Yeah, thank you for lifting up Bell. Um, love Bell. Bell has been so um, her her work and her friendship, her life has been foundational um, for me. Um, thinking about love is is a lot has a lot to do with her. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, when I think about what keeps the biggest evil at work that keeps me us separated, me separated from you, um, us separated from each other, me separated from the other, right? Like is um, these sort of gaping spaces and whatever exists, whatever causes that space to exist, whether that is um, not a wide enough aperture to understand the need to, uh, what I, races, just whatever the thing is. Mm -hmm. Love for me is the active energetic will it's the energy the the, the movement um, the thing that one must do one must commit to to steadily ensure that that space decreases between us so that we end up chest to chest yeah. um, now all of that includes will and choice mm -hmm. right like love can't be I think enacted um, as if it's an energy that doesn't require us to activate it. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, often I always say like love is also not a cheap offering. That work 
to do that, um, you know, like, what does it mean to close the gap between me and maybe someone who harmed me? Mm. Um, that's not easy. Well, Baldwin said love is a battle, right? You want to talk about yeah. a battle. What does it mean to like, and I'll, I'll, for me, I often say like, love is like, in a relationship, as an example, sure, I can talk about the butterflies I get in my stomach. Cool. That shit's dope. Oh, yeah, my partner did this today. But love for me is like my partner meeting me chest to chest after we would have worked through some hard shit. Maybe I wronged him. Maybe I didn't listen closely enough. Uh, maybe I haven't been showing up. But even despite that, somehow he committed to removing the barriers that existed between us and found me and met me right there back that's, to, that's love like that's come good. on yeah that's good you know what i mean i i know exactly um, what you mean <laughs> and that the gift isn't just for the recipient of it it is also a gift offering to the giver mm -hmm. too. yeah your your late friend bell goes on to talk about how love has these attributes, right? Or these ingredients, and they are mixing care, affection, recognition, respect, commitment, trust, and open, con and open communication. All those things are the attributes. Those are the ingredients that make up love. And I want to list those again for people who are listening, because I think it's important when people talk about, oh, I love you, or I'm a Christian and I love people. Well, what does love look like? How do you put that love into action? And again, it's a mix of care. Caring for people, yes, that is an attribute of love, but caring alone is not enough. Affection, yes, we all think of romantic love and affection and kisses on the forehead and whatever, that's great, but that's not the only measure of love. Recognition, seeing another human being, seeing them for how they see themselves and who they see themselves, that recognition is a key attribute of being able to love someone. Um, respect, of course, commitment and trust, which cannot be understated. But again, and communication, people always forget 50% of communication mm -hmm. is active listening, mm -hmm. listening to what somebody's expressing to you and their words, their actions, mm -hmm. their, their, their glance, their gaze. It's, it's all those things. Um, and I, I just wanted to make sure we had a working definition of love that we can use going forward as we, uh, as we talk about this stuff, because the, you know, my next question for you is as a child, did you feel at the time, did you feel loved as a child and as an adult, what's your relationship to that love specifically when you think about your dad and some of the things that you write about in the book? It's so interesting because I literally wrote down while you were talking, what does love feel like? And I, I, I used to explore that, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, what does it look like? We sort of can name that, but what does it feel like? And um, I, um, in my home, I was loved as a, as a child. And now it's interesting, you know, I write, one sentence where I say the same hand that my dad used um, to teach me how to to bathe as a kid when I was yeah. learning how to wash under my balls, as he said, <laughs> <laughs> was the same hand that I watched him beat my mother with. Yeah. So, what does love feel like then in those moments? Because I also believe that like love doesn't happen in isolation. That uh, love is a it it, it can be experience between two people but love is it's collective right um what i felt was a sense of profound um i, I felt that i was cared for mm -hmm. right like I, I felt care um but i also felt profoundly like confounded by what was being miscommunicated to me by virtue of my father's actions, just to use him as an example. Yeah. And so what am I supposed to feel when, you, when you're when you hugging me and saying, good, yes, son, you, you know, make me, and I don't necessarily feel good in that moment because I know that you also use that hand to beat my mama. Right. So I, I would say that um, I spent a lot of time throughout my young adult, like my childhood, teens, young adult life, with a complicated relationship to myself, who I am, um, 
in the world, how I am to be in the world, how people ought to show up for me intimately because of the rewiring I need to do (laughs) (laughs) to understand that love for the most part, as it was taught to me, wasn't most of the shit that I saw, you know, people like if you, you know, because I, I look, look, we come from, you, you're a seminary grad, you know, Bonhoeffer talks about like cheap grace, costly grace and like costly love, cheap love, like the cheap version of mm-hmm. love is like, yeah, I beat the shit out of you. And, you know, just forget that's never what I'm saying when I said that we need to remove the barriers that exist right. to remove barriers. There has to be accountability. There has to be some owning of the things that we did wrong a turning away from those things, a repentance is mm-hmm. that word, right? Um, so as an adult, I finally got to a place where I understood that my, that ultimately, um, uh, man, I, I can go down some, st- the, if I, let me just take a, a sort of Avenue A, get off the road <laughs> here and I come back. Most of the relate, I'm going to just go to intimate relationships because I particularly like to talk about this as a black queer man. Mm-hmm. Most of the intimate relationships I was in at the be- very beginning of my journey were with people who mirrored my dad. Yeah. Either they were physically abusive or just like mentally, emotionally, like psychologically damaging. <laughs> they were terrorists. Imagine being attracted to that. But... And I and but here's the thing, like and until I was able to look at myself in the mirror mm-hmm. and say, Okay, Darnell, I love every aspect of the image that I see. I love your big ass lips, I love your nose, um, I love your quirky eyes, I love your skin color, I love um, the sort of the, 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 the energy that you get when you create, I, I, I love you in spite of the things you did. I love you in spite of the selfishness that you can sometimes have. Like love, I loved all of myself. Um, and that was the sort of, the sort of, um, transition to me moving into healthier relationships with people in which I was then able to really determine what was love and what the wasn't. Right. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but, you know, for me today, um, love no longer feels confounded or at least in terms of how I need to sort of translate it being offered to me, mm-hmm. right? Love for me feels like um, not rescuing, but a a coming together. It feels like... Mm, it feels like a lack of a fear, even if I experience, um, you know, moments of like, yeah, lack of fear, even if, even in the midst of moments that feel confounded, but still love present means I don't got a fear. Yeah. And I'm saying that as an adult, because that's not what it felt like in, um, in the beginning. That's what I had to sort of journey to. Mm-hmm. No, that's, uh, that's definitely, you answered the question, both of them. <laughs> and uh, you answered a difficult question well, because it's, you know, it's tough. Um, but I, I ask again, because it's super important to understand what you've experienced as your journey to through love and to experiencing what love really is and understanding that in such a way that you can then apply it to the work that you're doing and to the person that you are moving through the world as. Um, when you think about, again, care and affection and recognition and mm-hmm. respect and commitment and trust and open, honest communication, um, you know, how have you seen that show up for you and the work as the motivation for the work that you do as also is part of the process and the methods that you employ and others that, you know, working you know, alongside employ, because I think for me, that becomes a measure of how sincere people really are about the work. Are you doing this from a loving space? Yeah. Are you doing this? That's a great question. I, my easy out for that would be, um, I've been in a lot of spaces, organizing spaces, um, you know, creative artistics, whatever the space is. And I have figured, and, and, and it might be the Aquarius in me, I can't really account for um, the way that other people show up to the work, whatever that work is, whatever right. that space is. I can't account for me. And I don't do anything unless I love it at this point in my life. Mm-hmm. If I don't love it, I ain't called for that. 
right? <laughs> because love is work. Like love, and, and when I say work, I don't mean like I'm not talking about like just the thing that one needs to get paid for. Like if I'm going to commit my energy, my body, my mind, my spirit to a thing, mm-hmm. I'm coming to it with love. To the extent that I'm in, in spaces with people who don't have that. And it's at scale. I don't need to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's I'm, that's me working. Whether it's we sitting down and we co-writing an essay, or we building an organization. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like love has to be at the center. Like I get my questions, and and what I mean by that is like, what is driving you? What are your motivations? Mm-hmm. What's keeping you up at night, and what's putting you to sleep? Those things are going to determine the output. They are. Not, and not only the quality of the output, but, you know, who's benefiting and how you do exactly what I mean. Yeah, yeah. all the things. Um, and, you know, when, when one reflects on love and, and what it means to love, I think we'd be hard pressed to deny that the world definitely feels like it's in need of love today. Mm. Love's in need of love today, to quote Stevie Wonder. Um, and, you know, we it almost feels lovelessness. Like mm-hmm. there's a sense of lovelessness in the air, uh, you know, whether it's greed and capitalism, whether it's anti-black racism, whether it's, you know, anti-trans violence, it just seems like such a lack of love today. And one of the big challenges is, you know, what are the institutions that are supposed to engender that love? What are the institutions of good that are supposed to create a safe space for people to uh, be held accountable, but in a loving way that heals them and heals the persons that they've harmed? I don't know what those institutions are. I know what one should be, uh, and it's the church, but it has been almost anything but that so often. Um, in our communities, man, where have, where have you found or do you see spaces that seem to contribute to that? And if not, you know, what do we need to do individually and collectively to start to imagine the institution that could exist that can, you know, be that ground? Uh, Listen, I... Um... I go very micro. Um, you know, you when you got to LA, I told you, hey, we do this thing called Super Fridays every mm-hmm. um, every Friday. Um, yeah, you know, black people there get in the pool, and yeah, we we got stuff in the barbecue. But the idea behind that is to create um, a space for people to be in community with one another. Um, so I, I use that as an example to say, as a person who has railed at those same institutions you named, mm-hmm. I've spent most of my life railing at these institutions that, I, that you named. Um, I've got, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm really good at, at um, you know, deconstructing and, and, and sort of like doing this, pointing the finger and saying, y'all wrong. I'm like, I want to spend a good amount of my energy creating possibilities out of where, where we don't see them. So my answer would be all of us, each of us, you and I, everybody that's listening to this, every day we have an opportunity. Every day we have an opportunity to create the counter container, the countercultural um, institution, <clears throat> the ecclesia. And that might be in your de- in your basement and y'all dancing to house music or it could be around a dinner table on a stoop or it could be over a phone call or a group chat you know during a pandemic i'm like i'm lonely i want to be around other artists let me just or ask these 10 people if they just want to start meeting to mm-hmm. share work we don't gotta wait for nobody yeah. to create the things that we need for our survival and in a world where we know that it lacks, we have within us everything that it takes to create the opposite. You're doing it right now. I'm here talking to you. Mm-hmm. After we both had long days refueling ourselves on love. So where I see it, I see it right here. I see it in the everyday. And it's not even a spectacular shit. You know what I mean? It's not mm-hmm. even a spectacular shit. It's in the everyday acts that we take that don't require nobody to give us no awards for, where we we just make space in our lives for other people. <laughs> yeah. No, you know what space, I mean? Yeah, I hear you. And space is important and just as important as respect and recognition, man. Because mm-hmm. when you talk about, when I asked you about what love feels like, I you know was thinking about it myself. And I think about love feels like being seen. 
being seen in a loving gaze, being seen in a gentle gaze, being seen in a nurturing gaze, being seen. And, you know, so many of us are forced to, you know, we're either invisible or made to be feel invisible or we're made to, you know, deny the truth of who we are, whether it's queer, whether it's trans, whether it's political, you know, leading liberal or conservative, we're made to hide who we are as opposed to really presenting our authentic selves to the world, embracing that. And if there's something that, hey, that doesn't serve you or society well, let's talk about it, but do that in a loving space. And in the absence of that, you know, so many of us grow up kind of organically compartmentalizing ourselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, so much so that you hardly even recognize who, and you mentioned this in one of the conversations I listened to uh, preparing for this, you talked about becoming his avatar as opposed mm -hmm. to being who you really are. You becoming this just his avatar, it's his character that you play mm -hmm. uh, in the world. And I definitely have experienced that myself. And even when you've done the work to oh, heal, yeah. it's a process that is essentially never ending because the Absolutely. damage, the psychic wounds are so deep. Mm -hmm. that you hold on to it for a long time. And, you know, ex exhibit A, I'm preparing, as I told you before we started, uh, I've got my first uh, solo ex exhibition in New York, mm -hmm. right? And I, I'm working on work for that. And as I do that, I'm thinking about the questions that I ask in the work mm -hmm. and which work I'm going to show and how I'm going to present it. And I have this amazing, beautiful body of queer work that mm -hmm. I've been working on for some time as part of the community. I mean, I'm out, I'm open. Everybody knows I'm It's mm -hmm. not a secret. Right? And even then, Mm -hmm. I thought for a moment, like, oh, this part of my tribe, mm -hmm. they know who I am, but how are they going to respond to them? And I realized mm -hmm. that that compartmentalization, those walls, many of them have been knocked down, but some are still standing with little yes. holes in them, but they're still standing. Yeah. How is, what's been the legacy of that compartmentalization in your life and how have you been able to move forward, man? Same. It's like I have to walk around um, always with the sledgehammer in the backpack. <laughs> you know, like I'm in the barbershop and I'm like 47 in the barbershop, you know, and I'm like oh, having to remind myself, okay, if you hear some, some, some shit, cause you might hear some shit, you know what I mean? What you, are you going to say something? Right. <laughs> are you going to let it ride? And by letting it ride, you're going to, you know what I'm saying? Get the slash hammer out the back. <laughs> <Take it right laughs> <down, right> <laughs> <laughs> so like, you know, and you know, to the micro, like, at, at, you know, I'm in, I'm, okay, who are you, who are you today in this relationship, Durga? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Are you going to, um, what does your partner need? What, it, what is, uh, you know, what are you doing to sort of like not um, replicate some of these masculine learnings that you have become so accustomed to? All right, you hurting today. Did you tell him you hurting? Are you just going to do that same old bullshit? You walking around, everything's okay. Get out the sledgehammer, Darnell. Knock that wall down. Mm -hmm. And it's daily work. Like, we have all breathed in. I, let me use an I statement. I breathed in sexism and mal notions of maldominance. And, you know, I walked around calling myself a top for most of my life and all the ideas that went along with that. And, shifted the way I thought about what I could do with my body and what the way I owned it. I mean, all types of shit. All the things. And guess what? If I had breathed, if I had took breathe that shit in like air, it doesn't so easily leave. So for me, the legacy is that it all is always already here looming. Right. I need to always ensure that I am aware when it shows back up <laughs> mm -hmm. as a schema, as a practice, and say, Slash Hammer, you're not going to walk around here today, Darnell, being some stale version of yourself, not letting that tear fall out your eye today. Yeah. Because you know boys don't cry. Knock that shit down. Knock it down. Um, so that's my work. And that's how I try <laughs> to sort of like <laughs> work through it every day. Yeah. You, you know, I, I do believe that we are made literally in the image and likeness of the creator. And as such, we are creative beings. And you are always creating, whether it's conscious or subconsciously, <laughs> you're creating with your choice. And yes. so just you're choosing to knock that wall down. You're choosing to not lean into what could be easy 
Um, those are choices. But in those choices, you're declaring to the universe and you're reminding yourself who you've chosen to be, who Amen. you're creating uh, to be. And that's what we are, man. We're human beings, mm -hmm. being loving, being kind, mm -hmm. being nasty, being evil, whatever, we, but we're mm -hmm. humans being. And the mm -hmm. being is always in, in that, that choice. And you got to heal at some point and healing requires a, a couple of things, not just forgiveness from other folks or you doing the work on, on yourself, but it really requires that you talked about earlier, man, accountability, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to, and you, there's something else you said, you said so many things are so freaking poetic, but this thing, this notion of being so concerned, and many of us are so concerned about whose foot is on our neck while paying very little attention to whose neck our foot is on. Mm -hmm. But that's equally important, not mm -hmm. only to the healing of the other person to have accountability to, for that, to stop doing whatever you were doing to cause them pain, to apologize for the pain, but it also helps to heal you to understand how okay. you've shown up for others. Um, and again, it's just, we need safe spaces to do that. Re that requires vulnerability. Yeah. How have you accessed vulnerability on your journey and in the work that you do? Oh, I'm so grateful for the people in my life that have been ears for me and arms for me. You know, um, one example that comes to mind, I was part of a writing community of black men, black cis, trans men, queer, straight. We used to call ourselves Brothers Writing to Live. Um, that was sort of the moniker, Kiesa Lehman, Mark Anthony Neal, Marlon Peterson, Michael Denzel Smith, Kai Green, now Fort Wade Davis. And on occasion, we write letters to each other. Um, in Kiesa's uh, book of essays, there's a, a, a passage called Echoes, where we're sort of writing back and forth. Mm -hmm. And part of that epistolatory process, the letter writing was meant to give us a space to be real on the page and to lay it all out there the good the bad the ugly the and to, and what a gift it was for me this is an example i'll offer um because if you can find community whether you're writing letters or like a phone call with people who will actually allow you to show up and to do the work of reckoning i like to call it self-reckoning which is a gift it's like looking at self in the mirror and going, you know, it's it's looking down at somebody else's neck and finding out that my feet is on their neck. And then when you get community, they can give you the tactics and the strategies to do the real work of taking your fucking feet off once you right. figure it out that's on somebody's neck. I've had community that helped me accountable who I could go to and say, look at something I done did, y'all. Look. I done did that bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you know what I mean? Like, and they're like, yeah, that's some bullshit. Like you were wrong. Mm -hmm. You were wrong. Um, and, and, and we're going to hold space for you um, to sort of sit with that. And eat. so I, I do believe that that type of transformation can only come, whether that's through the self-reckoning that we do in, co in the community with other people by creating community in whatever form mm -hmm. um, that can, provide us the space to, 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 to do that type of healing work. Yeah. I, I love that. I love community as a, as a, as you've said in the past, as a healing modality. I, I love that. Same thing with therapy. I think therapy is valuable. Oh for my gosh. So, so many people. Shout out to therapy. <laughs> Absolutely. There and social workers who anybody who listens to the show knows are the primary mental health practitioners oh in this country. And I didn't know yeah. that recently. And mm -hmm. every opportunity I get to share that I share it because when I think of social workers, I think of Claudine, but actually they are primary mental health practitioners and they're really important. Uh, before we go, man, um, I just want to talk a little briefly about what's, what's next for you, uh, in terms of your creative output and, and what do you think is next or current and remains as the important work that we need to do to heal our society and to push back against anti-blackness and all of its, uh, stepchildren? Um, wonderful questions. Not faint, not for the faint, uh, <laughs> for the weary, I must say, but uh, what's next for me? I am in a space in my life where I've been really grateful to be able to say yes to things that I feel only called to do, like that I that I love, not things that, like I, I get to say no 
mm-hmm. you know? So like, I, you know, and I also don't have the same timeline that I was working on before where it's like, you know, you better get this done because everybody else got 12,000 books and you better do this because everybody, I'm like, no, no, so you're on your own path. Mm-hmm. And when spirit says finish book two, I will. When spirit says, you know, you need to sit down and finally get the screenplay done. I'll do it. Um, you know, right now I have like, I don't know. I've, I've, I said one of my prayers was I miss creative Darnell. I miss arts Darnell. And then all of a sudden here I am working on as a partner, a collaborator on a, a book project with a, a Devin Allen a photographer out of Baltimore writing a piece for the upcoming book that Gordon Parks Foundation is publishing for him. And it's right after that, can you do this other essay in <laughs> Michelin Thomas's catalog? I'm like, what? Wait a minute. You know, and I did, you know, I wrote something for Clifford Prince King's um, exhibition this year. And it's interesting. Often is the case when spirit, like if I just avail myself, mm-hmm. spirit will send the things that I need to do. So that's really where I am. I'm like, what, what am I supposed to be doing in this moment? But in terms of the last question about healing, it goes back to what we just talked about. Um, and I, I honestly believe in, in, in the world that we are in now, which it, it sounds like cliche to say, we are not more any more politicized and sort of politically fractured. It's a different scale and a different te- technology that we have access to that brings it to, to scale. Mm-hmm. Um, but in a world where the sort of ask is for us to come in swinging with the critique of others, yeah. That's the that's the rule. Like, come in, read down, <laughs> down, read everybody else down, but turn Instagram off and go to sleep without ever looking at yourself. Mm-hmm. Critique this one over here for you know for hyper hyper capitalism, but then go on Twitter and be like, I'm just out here securing my bag. <laughs> call this one. Out. I'm look. I'm gonna keep it very real. You know, call this one out over here because you know they too flashy. Or what the hell ever, and you know, like I, I don't know, like, and I'm living my life as a fucking avatar. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Telling this one over here, they sexist as hell and misogynist, and then I got whatever, whatever music is blazing on my um. So for me, I think we have some work to do. We, all of us, some work mm-hmm. to do in what we just talked about. Like, y'all, we got. We are perf- we have perfected the art of point of, of naming the the, neck, the feet that are on our necks. We have not done the work, the self reflexive work, the self reckoning work to be honest enough with ourselves to say, "Oh shit, I got my feet up on somebody's neck too," and I'm gonna try my best. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get them things off, which is the third part, um, and that's hard. It's hard. Part of what I tried to do in my first book was to like not lie. Yeah. I can't write about like the monstrous shit that my dad did if I'm not going to talk about my own shit. I can't be up in here like, oh, down with the patriarchy and not talk about the ways I benefit from that shit and have had faith in it. I can't talk about the ways that like I have been antagonized as a queer person and was the same black gay dude who didn't want to date us on certain boys if they were too femme, who was walking around here. You, you hear what I'm you give them, yeah, So it's like I get free when I'm able to sort of like be real with myself. And guess what? The world won't change if we don't individually do that work. And I think all all of us, I do believe, unless there's somebody out here that's walking like Jesus, because Jesus probably had to do some work too. I do believe that all of us are called to do that work mm-hmm. of self-reflexivity. I believe that's going to be our route to healing. I love it. And I fully embrace it. And so many of the things you talked about, I've been, I've experienced, I know that I walk in a certain amount of privilege. I know I can turn off how gay I present it to the world if I want to. And there's privilege behind that. And there's also a lot of woundedness behind that. Why Absolutely. would you feel the need to turn off parts of yourself in Absolutely. the first place? Like it's, it's all the things. Um, but I, I appreciate your thoughtful answers. I appreciate your time and I appreciate your contributions to our culture mm-hmm. and our society. Uh, continue to do the good work wherever you decide to do it and however it shows Thank up. You. And I and cannot like, wait for your show. I can't just wait Just a little sneak peeks of what I, I'm like. It's powerful. It's beautiful and stunning. Just super, super grateful for you and your presence in the world. So thanks for having me.
Appreciate you. Darnell Moore, y'all, his book, uh, which you can still buy and read if you want to. It doesn't matter. It came out a few years ago. It's part of the lexicon now. <laughs> and there it is. It is No Ashes in the Fire, Coming of Age, Black and Free in America. It's, of course, available everywhere you buy books, Amazon, all the places. But uh, find a black bookstore to buy it if you can. Awesome. That would, I'm sure that would be appreciated. Darnell, we appreciate you, man. Uh, is there any social media you want to drop for folks? I just, I be on Instagram mostly. I got off of Twitter. What formerly Twitter now? Ugh, X. Whatever just, the toxic waste stuff. Yeah, yeah, but it's more Darnell on um, Instagram, and yep, that's it. And that's what the world needs more Darnell. <laughs> <laughs> all right, y'all. I'm Ricky. I've been waiting all day to say that. Uh, thanks again, Darnell. I love you, my friend, and I'll see you uh, soon. I love you too. Thank you. <laughs>